The world we live in today is the world after 9-11. It's a world where much of what we live with is a consequence of that day. And it's going to be that way for a long, long time. I think deep down, we all knew that would be the case as the horror of that day unfolded before our eyes. In those moments, before we fully yet comprehended the significance of the attack, we still dreamed that world we were living in was a world in which we thought the worst of history was over. The wall had come down, the nuclear standoff had ended, the core freedoms of private property and free markets were taking root in the third world and even in communist China. We saw a world of promise where freedom and prosperity would peacefully displace tyranny and poverty as the light of freedom swept forth. And then that light flickered. All that history that we had almost forgotten came crashing back into our conscience. And in that moment, we all rediscovered those hard words spoken long ago by Plato, only the dead have seen the end of war. A tragic fact is that much of the progress made in this world has depended upon some struggle somewhere of brave soldiers guarding the gates against the barbarians of their day. History's greatest lesson is that there's always an ongoing struggle between freedom and tyranny. And one always has to make a choice between the two. And to vacillate or appease or put off is to make a choice. That is why the decision of the president to close Guantanamo Bay and treat the terrorists as they were run-of-the-mill criminal instead of what they really are is nuts. Perhaps I should, should say, <laughs> perhaps I should say ill-advised <laughs> or naive. Think about it. Today, the presumption of innocence for the average American traveler has been lost. And yet, while we lose more and more of our daily freedoms, the cause of our loss, the terrorist, gains new freedoms through President Obama's dangerous sense of justice. From the dawn of civilization, there has always been this one rule of war. The warriors have worn uniforms not just to protect and identify themselves, but also to protect and identify non-warriors, the civilians. If you were dressed as a civilian and you engaged in acts of war, you lost all protections. Your only right was to a blindfold in face of a firing squad. Uniformed combatants had rights and innocent civilians had rights, but warriors in civilian clothes did not have rights. Why? Because without this distinction, all civilians would be suspect and at risk of wholesale slaughter. This way, although rulers and empires would fall, the people would survive. But no longer. This strange Obama sense of justice penalizes our civilians with their loss of freedom while rewarding the terrorists with new rights they never have had before in all of history. And another thing, I, I believe our globetrotting president needs to stop and take a brace and break and quit gallivanting all around. I think Rahm Emanuel, I think Rahm Emanuel ought to get some Gorilla Glue and put it in that chair behind the old office and say, sit down here, Mr. President. We've got some things we've got to solve here statewide before we go and visit other places in other countries. Now, I know that he can multitask. 
And I believe that there are multi-domestic tasks that he needs to be tasking on on this side of the world. When Thomas Jefferson was president, he once proclaimed that eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And when he said that, he was not talking about foreign invaders, but domestic usurpers as well. I ask you this question. Today, do we as free men meet the challenge of freedom domestically? Or have we come to expect government to not only protect us, but to compensate us, regulate us, nurse us, bail us out, compensate us from all, and isolate us from all the challenges of freedom in the marketplace or in dealing with each other? Today, the government has even become our stockbroker. But we don't have a choice, and we don't know the cost of the stocks in which he invests our family's money. You see, taxes are not just a means of raising revenue. They are also a price. Income taxes are a price paid for working. Taxes on profits are a price paid for being successful in business. Taxes on capital gains are a price paid for taking risk. And when you lower the price of work, when you lower the price on success, when you lower the price on risk taking, then you tend to get more work, more success, and more risk taking. And those are what fuel the free market system that keeps us on the cutting edge of change and secures true economic prosperity for millions of Americans. For too long, for too long in this country, we've sought the security that government could promise, but that only the labor of free men could provide. We accepted, for example, the unending promise of Social Security. My mother got it, I get it, but my grandchildren won't get it are only at a fraction of what was promised and less than what it could be. Why? Because over the years, Congress never had the guts to insist that resources be truly set aside to fulfill those promises. It was spent. It's not there. It's gone with the wind, as we say here in Georgia, gone with the wind in thousands and tens of thousands of past earmarks over the years.